This particular course is actually a follow-on course to the first one, which was the introduction to entrepreneurship. And the introduction to entrepreneurship, we actually went ahead and really focused on how do you take your idea and then evaluate it and do all of those things. And just as a quick, uh, quick refresher, uh, I'll spend about 30, 40 minutes going through all the PowerPoint slides uh, of the first course just so that uh, you know, people get refreshed a little bit. But uh, in this particular course, what we want to really focus on is some very specific skills that's going to help you make it. Uh, there are you know, so many skills that you know, we are not trained for in our corporate jobs, or especially if you start straight out of school or whatever, but we are not just trained for being an entrepreneur, because an entrepreneur, there is no employee handbook. There is no, you know, uh, there's no lawyer, corporate lawyer trying to guide you. There's no marketing guy, expert, who will tell you, you know, how to brand your product, how to name your product, how to price your product, how to, you know, write your first data sheet or PowerPoint slide or whatever, or how to make a presentation, how to negotiate, you know. So there are all kinds of, you know, uh, potholes everywhere. In, every, in just about every time you turn it, in, in any direction you face, there's a pothole. And you know, you're just not being trained for it. And um, uh, so for me, uh, you know, you'll see in my first company that I started 25 years ago, uh, we were just like you guys, with zero experience, you know, three engineers, marketing guy, not even a sales guy, I was a marketing guy, and the other three were engineers. We had never started a company, and you know, we still had to do everything, you know, pricing, coding, you know, customer care, all the things that we're gonna learn in this particular course. And uh, we actually came up with a specific way by which we learned on the job of how to do it. Uh, with the second company, it was a little bit easier because I'd, I'd done it all from zero to IPO with the first company, so I could. But you know, every company is different because in this case, one I moved from semi company to enterprise software. To you know, so a lot of dynamic changes, dynamic changes between the two companies. So some processes we could adapt, but other processes we had to change. So I felt that. You know, it was really important for entrepreneurs to at least get a fa fairly high level, uh, but broad understanding of what all the areas are. About, I identified about seven, eight different most important areas in terms of skills that, you know, but, you know, hopefully between the material that you're going to hear from me and the material that's on the portal, and then the guest speakers and the questions that you ask, you will have an understanding of what it means to negotiate with a VC, what it means to negotiate with the, your first customer, what it means to you know, uh, go ahead and try and strike a deal with your corporate lawyer, you know, sign up your first lawyer. I mean, you'll, you'll get a feel for how it's done so that um, you know, when you start doing it, at least you'll have some some basis, and you'll also have a lot of connections, as Nagesh said, that you can call up, you can, and you can start utilizing. So I think in this particular course, you know, we are not going to do a project in order to actually you know, take your idea and move it to the next point, uh, next milestone. But uh, you know, there will be a lot of homework. So because every week it's a new topic. And I want you, want you guys to do at least some investigation and thinking on your own as you answer the questions so that it starts you know, becoming a part of you. you know? So there'll be homework. And so we won't be able to get, give a grand prize or anything this time. 
But what I'm going to do is just to keep the motivation to do your assignments, uh, we decided that we'll give uh, three prizes for $100 each. So, so three students will be able to do this course for free. So, uh, uh, and, and then I'll show you how we're going to uh, do everything. Okay, so let's just get started with the course. And so here is uh, the portal that you're gonna sign up to. And I'll just uh, click on it as though uh, I was a student. Okay, so this is the panel that you, know, you guys will land up, uh, land up on as soon as you click on the Learn button. And uh, the, top, uh, 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 the top choices are the courseware, which is where all the courses are. Each week is identified with all its material, right? So you'll see that you know, it's got week one overview, then there's a second section, the BMC and the customer discovery presentation. Then you've got your business model canvas videos. Then you've got team building and com company culture presentation. And then there is the assignment, right? So if I click on assignment, and you know, all of you all should click it. And um, I'm just gonna minimize this for now. So you'll see that for class one, I want you to actually answer these three questions, right? And um, so you're going to view the BMC videos, which is right there, business model canvas videos. Uh, drop a BMC for any entrepreneurial idea. It doesn't matter, you can cook up any idea, but drop a BMC for it. And then um, if you already have a company started, you can write the profile of your co-founders or if you've got a, just a hypothetical idea, what would your co-founders be like? Just write a profile of them and for the next five employees, right? And then, uh, you know, one of the elements of creating a company that is going to work out well is to give it a culture. And uh, we, which is what we're gonna talk about in this course as to how do you give your company a culture so that, uh, you know, things operate the way you would like it to operate uh, so that it's successful in the marketplace, right? And so, what, so you'll answer these questions and then you will go ahead and uh, select a file. So do it all in Word and then upload the file. And then that file will be uploaded to the cloud and then uh, I will have access to all the people who have uh, uploaded the file. I'll have an Excel spreadsheet with all your names, and um, you know I'll just grade it. And next week you all can see the grades, you know, at the next class, right? So that way, like you know, uh, I personally think that you know uh, you have to make the investment on your own uh, of uh, doing more investigation on the topic that you know you're studying here for th two three hours, and actually putting paper to pencil, or pencil to paper, right? <laughs> and actually uh, writing some stuff down. Because it's uh, easy to imagine and think, but what you learn about entrepreneurship or any business is that it's really sunk in only when you actually write something down. <laughs> because that is commitment. Writing is a commitment. The minute you write it, it's a commitment. And, uh, you know, it's uh, so... I, I really insist that you know uh, people do this thing. So anyway, so that's going to be uh, the assignment. So if you look again at the course stuff, uh, in this particular course, um, really uh, the focus is to teach you, you know, uh, how to how a lot of different departments and functions will work in a startup in a startup because even when you don't have departments the functions still have to be done right the job still has to be done even though you may not have anybody sitting in that department running the department whatever you have to do it and the crazy thing is that as the ceo founder or, uh, you know whether you're co-founder or a ceo or whatever you'll find that uh, you are actually doing different jobs many times a day, right? You, you know, at one point you're a marketing guy, at one point you are uh, talking to your board, another point you're trying to raise money, you know, you're doing 
five or six or 10 different things in one day. So, you know, learning how to switch hats and still, you know, uh, do effective job of being a marketeer, being an engineer, being a test engineer, being a customer care person, being a salesperson, you know, being a collections person, trying to collect money for, you know, the product that you ship. I mean, you'll have to do all of that. And you, and that too, it's not like, okay, today my job is to collect money. And then my job is done, which is what accounts receivable would say. But, you know, as a startup co-founder, as a startup CEO, you'll have to raise money and the next minute you, you'll have to collect the money from your customer and the next moment you're trying to sell to, sell to the same, to that company or some other company your product for, you know, uh, also. So you're going from salesman to accounts collection to, you know, raising money to marketing, engineering, debugging, you know, whatever it is, you're doing a lot of, you're wearing a lot of hats uh, in one day itself, right? And it's so, it can be pretty disorienting to say the least. And, um, you know, you're going to need a personality that uh, can do such a thing, that can uh, enjoy multitasking, that can enjoy doing a whole gamut of uh, different functions and still with reasonable competence. Because, you know, if you're a bad salesperson, you know what that happens. If you lose a sale, you lost the sale, right? The company's lost the sale. If you go ahead and get the customer upset because, you know, you did not handle it properly, handle the sales call properly, or, you know, a customer decided to return the product because you did not do good customer care, or you did not write a good follow-up email, you know, do all of those things and you have to pay the consequences. In, in, and the feedback is very quick in the startup world and it's very direct, as Nagesh said. You know, the feedback is... It comes right right back at you if you if you haven't executed uh, any particular function correctly. So basically, like you know, um, we are going to try and cover all these areas. Uh, you know, today we are going to spend about uh, hour hour and a half on team building and company culture because I think it might probably be the make or break for a lot of companies. Uh, very hard for the person who comes up with the idea in the first place to actually build his founding team. Uh, a lot of people never get past the startup, the starting block of getting the first co-founder and then if you need a second co-founder and a third and if you need a fourth co-founder. Co Five, I think, is the maximum you want to go to in terms of co-founders. Uh, three is actually a good number, two is too small, um, three, four, five, and five is, too, is hitting the upper limit on co-founders. So uh, I would say that between three, four is perfect number in, in my opinion. Um, and you'll see why, because if you look at all the different functions that have to be done in a startup environment, if you have three or four people carrying the burden, uh, you'll find that, oh, this person's personality is analytic. He's a detail-oriented guy. Okay, let's put him in charge of managing the money. Let's put him in charge of, you know, HR. Let's put him in charge of, you know, doing the taxes, doing the, uh, you know, legal paperwork and so on, or renting the buildings, doing the COO job. So if he's the analytic, you can give it to him. Uh, if you're only one person, you would have to do that also. You have to be the analytic, you've got to be the visionary, you've got to be everything. Yeah, so the thing is that the functions that are not filled will automatically roll on to the CEO or the founder. So the CEO will have to do it, right? I mean, there's no, nobody else behind you to do the job. So whatever functions are not filled are your, is, are, are your departments. You automatically got them. So the point is that... Um, you know, what you want to do is as your idea becomes more and more uh, validated, and you'll see what I mean by validated in, in a few minutes, uh, where you're ready to start making real commitments, which is like quitting your job or getting your first space or, you know, starting to buy equipment for your 
or the idea that you got of starting to, you know, con- subcontract to a team in India to do something uh, or, or wherever to do, to do some development, you know, ready to sign some contracts. Uh, by once you're getting there, you better be very actively looking for co-founders. Uh, the faster you can get there, the better. Uh, just to give you some idea, I, um, you know, with my first company, Opti, you know, uh, there were three Chinese engineers who used to work for me. And, you know, they suddenly quit, one quit, and the second quit, and the third quit. I had no idea where they were, why they were quitting on me, but they quit. And uh, then uh, six or eight weeks later, they called me up and invite me for lunch. I was happy to meet these ex-employees of mine. <laughs> and uh, they said, you know what? Uh, I think we're going to start a company. <laughs> you know, we've already started a company or whatever. And, you know, we need uh, a person who understands marketing and business and all of that. And can you join me? And here, like, you know, I'm kind of director at uh, Chips and Technologies with, you know, 40 people reporting to me in marketing and everything. And, uh, and, you know, these three top engineers that I used to work, that used to work with me are asking me to quit that to join, join them. And, and, you know, after, uh, talking with my wife and thinking about it, and I knew how wonderful these engineers were and how smart they were, I said, you know, you've got to take a jump. And so I took my first jump and that was, you know, a fabulous uh, thing for me to make that jump. So, you know, they, that Opti team, and as soon as I came in, the team was done. Because the rest were three engineers, and to have somebody who had business background, marketing background, MBA, all of that for, you know, uh, eight or ten years, Intel experience, whatever, and suddenly three engineers, marketing guy, uh, uh, and marketing slash sales guy, the team is done, right? Uh, with uh, Selectica, the next company, uh, the, the founder was a brilliant AI PhD from Xerox Park. He had developed the whole technology for artificial intelligence and ported it to Java and so on. And, you know, he was convinced that, you know, he had a multi-billion dollar idea. It was going to be a great product. And so for five years, he must have visited 45 VCs and you know, used to do consulting on the side for three months, and then nine months he's developing product. And for five years, he tried to get the company off the ground himself. But, you know, uh, no VC invested any money in him. So they said, where's your team? You know, so uh, <clears throat> while all his competitors got funded with less technology, his competitors got funded, and they started building up the marketplace. But here, the guy with the best technology and configuration, because he was, didn't have a team, could not get funded. And I met him at Tycon in uh, 1996. Luckily, I was out of Opti by then. And uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, it, we, we met a couple of times, and he said, you know, why don't we get start? You know, can you join me? Because I can't do this on my own. I've tried it for five years, I can't do it on my own. But it took him five years to realize that he needed a co-founder who was complementary to him, right? So it took him five years, because at that time we did not have Ty and so on that active anyway. So, so uh, and then like, you know, um, uh, he and I kind of, you know, joined, joined together and then uh, it ended up, you know, I did not know enterprise software that well, because I was, uh, Semi guy, even though I knew the business side of the world, marketing, sales, finance, all of public relations, everything. I knew all of that, but I did not know the prod, the business of enterprise software. Was I was a semi guy, and uh, then Vas, you know, we played tennis. We used to play tennis together, and and Vas had already started his company. You had already started your company, right, at that time? Yeah. He's already started his company, and then I was telling him about, about this amazing technology and how the internet is going on. And 
he decided to abandon his company to join and become the third co-founder of Selectica. So, so and we merged our companies. Yeah, we merged the companies. <laughs> yeah, and then became Selectica. So, so the point is that you know, and and when the three of us came together with his knowledge of you know how this enterprise software business works, my knowledge of how finance, marketing, sales, legal, all that stuff works, uh, especially in a small to company that went from nothing to a public company. And then kind of the AI guys, uh, PhD and research and reputation and all that stuff. Okay, team is done, right? We don't know, need any, anybody more. So I would say that, you know, um, uh, creating the founding team is definitely um, probably one of the most make or break kind of things that you're going to decide. Uh, in your startup. And uh, <clears throat> it's really important to go ahead and uh, uh, do it correctly, do it properly. And you know, we, we'll discuss uh, a lot of that and there's a lot of reading material on the web that you can, that I'll direct you uh, on to and so on. Uh, so then uh, next week we'll do marketing, uh, especially global marketing and so on, and business development. And uh, that's a very, very important function because as soon as you get your product done, you've got to get your marketing stuff done. Um, third topic is selling. You know, sales is something that every time, time I meet an entrepreneur, it's like, I hate selling, you know. <laughs> I hate the job of selling. Unfortunately, that is the most important thing that any entrepreneur, skill that entrepreneur needs to develop and it's almost mandatory that he, that, he, that he becomes a good salesperson, right? And uh, because in a sense, if he's going to continue to grow with the company, uh, it'll only happen if he becomes a top-notch salesperson because you're selling all the time. You're selling your employees, you're selling your partners, you're selling your customers, you're selling your investors, you're selling your directors, you're selling the press, you're selling all the time. You know, it's, it's like you do, if you're good at it as an engineer or whatever, you'll do that in the night, but during the 10 hours that you're in the office, you're doing selling, you know. So that is very important skill. Uh, and following that is negotiating. So along with selling, you're negotiating all the time. Everything is a negotiation. When you hire an employee, like, you know, in fact, from getting your co-founder, that's a negotiation, you know. Because, you know, he comes with a different expectation, different, uh, uh, you know, situation uh, from his career standpoint or whatever. Now you're trying to get together and build your new company. So uh, it's a negotiation. Every, about, yeah, everything is a negotiation. Uh, yeah. The time it takes for someone to return your phone call, that's also a negotiation. <laughs> exactly. As, as you know. Everything is a negotiation. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, learning the process of negotiation uh, is very important. And uh, it's not taught almost anywhere. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, at Intel, uh, basically, like I, I joined the marketing group at Intel after four or five years at GE as an engineer. I did my MBA and I joined uh, Intel in marketing. And the lovely thing about Intel was they had Intel University where negotiation was a core, two-day course uh, called Karis Negotiating. And, and they still have it actually on, uh, uh, in San Francisco called Karis, K-A-R-A-S-S, -S, uh, Karis Negotiating. I would recommend everybody to write it down. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, they, they made every person in marketing and sales take this two-day course uh, on negotiating. And the great thing about that course is that it'll help you as much outside the company as inside the company. It'll help you when you negotiate with your spouse, <laughs> with your children, with your, you know, when you're buying clothes. Uh, for me, it helped me buy my first house because, you know, we made the offer, they accepted the offer, and then uh, that was a hot market at that time, and uh, 
a day later, my uh, real estate agent says that uh, they've turned down your offer. I said they'd accepted it. He said, no, they've turned it down because they got another offer for $5,000 more. So I said, no, they've given me a signed document which says, he says, no, that document doesn't mean anything. This is my real estate agent telling me this. And, uh, but I'd taken the Karis negotiating course. So this was a perfect opportunity for me to exercise my negotiating skills, right? So I told uh, the real, real estate agent that uh, I want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with this person. And, uh, you know, he said, not possible, etc. I said, uh, just tell him that, you know, if he doesn't do it, I'm going to file a lawsuit against him. Let's threaten the lawsuit. File a lawsuit against him. And he thinks he's going to make $5,000 more. He's going to spend $25,000 trying to and lose three to six months. And by that time, the market might have cooled down, et cetera. And so I said, I'm, you know, he's got to see me. Otherwise, I'm going to file a lawsuit. So I got him to the negotiating table. They said, OK, come. So I went to the house. And then I see that you know, it's actually a divorce situation between the husband and wife. That's why they're selling the house. Uh, so here is you know, how you build up your your negotiating position, right? So suddenly now I know that they're divorcing because you know the husband is walking this side, the wife is walking this side. They don't want to talk to each other, but you know I'm sitting. Me and Kalpana, my, my wife are sitting there, trying to discuss with them, and they can't talk to each other because they are fighting on, on, in a divorce situation. And um, so I said, uh, <clears throat> so I explained to them that you know, in a nice way that. You know, if they've signed something, you know, they're going to make a good profit. You know, if they agree with uh, going through the transaction, you know, it's going to be the best outcome for them. And they agreed. So this Karis negotiating helped me buy my first house and bought it uh, where, you know, I was already sitting $5,000 plus, right? From the minute I, because it had already appreciated by 5000 by the time I bought it. So, so Karas negotiating is going to, or this negotiating thing that we discuss is going to help you for everything that you, that you do in your life. Yeah. So then uh, customer care is absolutely the most important. And the reason why it's, it's not just words, okay, customer care and things like that. Uh, because essentially for a startup, uh, you're basically playing with fire and you're making the customer take a lot of risk that he doesn't, that the customer doesn't know he's taking when he uses a startup's product, right? So you're making him, and uh, so it's going to require, you know, excellent customer care skills in order to see that the deal doesn't fall apart. Because if the deal falls apart, because obviously the product is going to have limitations, you have oversold, you have uh, promised something, you know, and, uh, and, and you know you've got best intentions of getting it done, but, you know, it, it, things take time, right? So, so in this particular case, um, you know, customer care is what's going to get you over the hump, get you the extra time in order to go ahead and uh, get your product done, make them a referenceable uh, customer and all that good stuff. So um, customer care is extremely important uh, to understand and know how to do it, know how to follow up with the customer, know how to handle a crisis situations with the customer. You know, when he wants to drop you like a hot potato, calls you, you know, gets very upset with you, whatever. So you got to know how to do customer care better than you know, the department that's going to do customer care once you become big. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the next one, and the next, two, next one is really presentation skills, which is knowing how to basically communicate what you're trying to, the point you're trying to make, or the sale you're trying to make, or the deal you're trying to make. So your presentation uh, skills is going to be, need to be top notch. And presentation skills is all about actually, you know, communicating where they have confidence 
and what they hear from you. You know, you don't destroy your credibility the minute you open your mouth, right? You, you want them to believe you and to take you seriously, you know, when you, when you make your presentation. And you'll be making presentation to your, uh, to your employees. And in a startup, presentation to employees is make or break for your company. Because, you know, uh, if you're running out of money, you know, in a startup, you can't hide it. You know, everybody knows it, right? <clears throat> so, you know, how you communicate to your customers, uh, but if the employees quit on you, your company is going to die anyway, right? So, you, you know, they have to, you have to con- be able to convince them to uh, stick with you through thick and thin, etc. cetera, uh, uh, through disappointments. There's going to be more disappointments than successes in a startup, you know. First, a lot of the initial sales are, deals are not going to go through. You're going to lose against the competition over and over and over again. And the question is, how do you communicate with your employees so that, you know, they hang in with you, hang in with you, hang in with you, and take it as uh, to keep improving the product so that, you know, you finally um, end up with a great product. But essentially, employees have to hang in with you, and you've got to be able to communicate all of this to the employees. How do you create your uh, culture, company culture with your employees, etc.? cetera? <clears throat> uh, same thing with uh, customers. How do you present to customers? Because essentially, when you go presenting to customers, you know, you might be talking to the engineers, you've got to talk in one way. You're going to be talking to the marketing group, you've got to talk in another way. You're talking to the vice president, you've got to talk in the other way. You're talking to the CFO, you've got to talk in a third, fourth different way. Everybody needs a different spin. And uh, knowing how to present uh, <clears throat> and, you know, if you've got too many slides, you're going to lose the deal. If you've got too few slides, you know, may not make the point, you know. So, so like, being, ab- being able to make a point uh, when you get a chance, uh, you, you, you go and just uh, uh, jump on the opportunity, that is, uh, you know, that might be the key to, you know, making the sale, et cetera. So, so presenting to customers... And then, of course, the investors. Huge challenge, right? Uh, trying to convince people to actually put money into something that they don't really understand as well as you do uh, is no joke, you know. So uh, presenting to investors and then, um, you know, if you make it all the way to a public company, then presenting to, you know, the Wall Street Journal and to the press and everybody else's another set of challenges, right? So, so, and then finally, like, you know, building and managing a board of directors. So as soon as you take professional money, your board starts coming in and they are actually the boss of the CEO, right? The board can decide to move you out anytime, right? So, and you may be able to have some control over your board, uh, uh, board, you know, during the first round or the second round. But by the third round, uh, typically, the board will be, able, will be controlling the CEO or the founders. You know, it, it's, it's uh, hard to retain control <clears throat> of the board. And, and so really, they have to, you have to work with the board in a way that they basically want you to actually run the company. You have to be able to work with them in a way that kind of uh, makes them feel that by s- supporting you and choosing you to run the company, they are going, they're making the right decision, right? So, and you have to do this for years on end, right? You've got to do it month after month, you know, sometimes with good news, sometimes with bad news, and yet they should have confidence in you. So sometimes you decide that, hey, everything I told you for the last 18 months is not right. <laughs> they are changing direction. So... So, and yet they should not fire you, right? So, huh? Yeah, the board basically, you know, we will cover that in more detail, but in a nutshell, <clears throat> typically with each round, you add a board member. Whoever leads the round typically comes on the board. And uh, typically, 
you will bring in at least one independent or two independent directors as the company grows. It's a part of the in, uh, legal company formation process that mandates that you have to have a board. Even if you are a one-person company, you you will be the board. Uh, you know, the you'll board be a single-person board member. Yeah. But then, like, if That's you decide that you and your co-founder, you got three founders, <laughs> but you decide that you know, all three can't be on the board or should not be on the board. It's not recommended. So typically one or two people should be on the board. And um, and uh, I think Sham Das is an expert on board management. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll get him on the stage for that. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so uh, basically you're right. It's, it's the number of shares. That's why I said by the time that you do the third round of funding, ABC funding, but the third round of funding, typically, they loan more than 50% of the stock. Mm -hmm. So, it at least 35 yeah, it's very difficult. If you need money, you've got to pay. Mm -hmm. They'll take it. Yeah, that's why we've got Shamdas, <laughs> who's the guru of uh, stock, uh, <laughs> stock yeah, and board management. <laughs> anyway. I think we should not go too deep into that one. But anyway, we will cover all of that in a full session. Yeah. Yeah. So we should, we'll talk all of that. But you'll have to wait for six weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so, because it's, it's a, it, I mean, some of the newer companies, social media companies have done brilliantly. I mean, Google has done an amazing job of uh, two kinds of stocks. Facebook has done that. So this is a new evolution. And uh, it happens only when, the investors are desperate to get in no matter what. Then you have the ability to do these kinds of, you know, two, uh, two uh, kinds of shares and things like that. A and B preferred stock and all that stuff. But in general, for most entrepreneurs, we need the money more than, <laughs> than and, and we are chasing them, yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope you guys got the class schedule. Unfortunately, because Wednesdays were... A couple of Wednesdays were booked. We, we are doing this Friday evening class. But in general, it's a Wednesday uh, 6 to 10 class. Uh, but here are the dates. Uh, I think we have it, uh, yeah, I think one or two uh, weeks is a Friday class. Otherwise, it's basically Wednesday classes. OK. Um, what else, I think? OK. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, these are important books that, you know, are part of my library and uh, things that have really shaped me in uh, helping get uh, quality, um, uh, understanding and ability to execute uh, different functions. So they're all here and, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll dig in deeper into each of these areas, uh, some of these books uh, as we go into some of the areas, okay? but. Uh, over time, I would say that you, know, you should build up your own library for all the different areas that you're going to require as, uh, that you're going to require uh, to be an entrepreneur. And, uh, and uh, so that's, that's important. If you don't have the time, just take Raj's class. <laughs> no, there's a huge amount of uh, stuff that, you know, these books and uh, other, co you know, you'll have to, I think once you get this exposure here, I think it's going to be just the start of the journey. Okay, guys. I mean, it's unrealistic to basically think that a one three-hour class on selling or on marketing or negotiating or customer care, or, uh, you know, is going to, you know, give you everything. Right? It's unrealistic. But on the other hand, uh, my objective was to kind of just make it real, make all these areas real for you. So with some ideas to how to attack it when you when you start running into it, right? How to solve the problems as they come up. Give you some tools, yeah. Okay, so that's there. Uh, quite a bit of the. Okay, so this is some of the readings, some of the uh, web website, etc. Important URLs will be here. Uh, the wiki is a place where. Um, uh, all of you can go ahead and put in things. So this time, 
to a large extent, we are not going to do projects, but uh, if we were doing projects, you know, uh, you would be putting in articles, but we'll figure out, you know, if, if there are any opportunities to do that. Okay, so here um, in the first section, we just went through the courseware. In the next section, I just want you to quickly remember that, you know, the, there are all kinds of entrepreneurial startups, but the ones that we care about in Silicon Valley are startups that are scalable, repeatable, and profitable. So these are the three parameters that we want for Silicon Valley startups and the company, the courseware and everything is going to focus on scalable, repeatable, and profitable startups. So they're not focused on mom and pop shops or mom and pop businesses. And there's like, you know, 50 million of those in the US. Uh, or five, 10 million or whatever. But we are focused on the scalable, repeatable, profitable startups because these are the ones that have the maximum leverage. You know, a small company with 100 employees could be worth $100 million. Won't happen if you're not a scalable, repeatable, profitable business. Yeah. Why repeatable? No, no, repeatable means um, the things that you do in the company are repeatable. So say you do sales, and if you can sell your product in the Texas region, you don't need to develop a new sales process to sell it in the New York region. You may have to adapt it a little bit, but it, you don't have to redo the entire sales process. So it should be something that can be repeated so that uh, we can, you can just hire people to do the sales, right? So you just do the sales training, and now suddenly the company's business starts growing. Uh, repeatable can also be repeatable where you do a low-end product, mid-range product, high-end product. You know, it's repeatable. You, where you don't redo all the engineering required for your product. You can, you know, address multiple market niches, by adapting a little bit here, changing a little bit there, features, etc. So only businesses that can leverage uh, the multiplier effect, uh, where you hire a salesperson for $100,000, he brings in a million dollars of sales. Now you're in a repeatable business because you just got to hire 100 salespeople and you're a $100 million business, right? Supposedly. So, uh, <clears throat> so the whole idea is that it should be repeatable. That's the idea. Scalable means that, you know, it's something where, you know, you can uh, uh, basically grow it as big as you want, right? Like Facebook was scalable, right? Uh, search is scalable, right? So these are all scalable. And profitable is because ultimately, Every entrepreneurial organization, if it doesn't get to first cash flow break even and then to real profitability, it's going to have a limited future. Because uh, if you're borrowing money all the time to keep growing, you're going to lose pretty much the whole company at some point. So why did you start the company in the first, process, first place, right? So, um, so that's why, you know, the whole focus is... Scalable, repeatable, profitable business, right? Uh, the next thing to realize is that um, the there's first one, uh, step... There's one exception to that rule, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> but now that Alibaba has come into the picture, <laughs> Amazon's going to figure out how to get profitable fast because Alibaba, you know, has shown that you can be an e-commerce company similar to Amazon, but insanely profitable, right? And that's, uh, I hope Flipkart follows the Alibaba model and not the Amazon model. <laughs> yeah. Flipkart is going to be a hybrid. Yeah. Okay, so um, the next thing, I'd like, to, like you to just read this article because it kind of tells you that, you know, the biggest challenge for a startup is to figure out whether the idea and the company that's built around the idea has at least a good chance of building a company on top of it, right? So searching for 
uh, idea that you can build a company on is one of the hardest things that an entrepreneur faces. And and uh, the tool that you know we studied last time was the business model canvas, which basically allows us to rule out 80 to 90% of the ideas before we have invested our life and our earnings and savings into that company, right? So one of the things that I saw in a lot of Silicon Valley Thai startups is uh, people don't value their own time enough. You know, just because a friend came up with an idea for a startup, they go and jump into it, you know, head first. And, uh, you know, three months, six months go by and um, they start developing the features, the products, everything else. And they've not even figured out whether it has even a remote chance of being successful in the company, uh, in the marketplace. So they jump into starting companies uh, around an idea way before they could easily figure out whether it's going to be viable or not. You know, so it's really important to realize that ultimately the thing that you've got least amount of it's not money, it's really your time, your time. Because, you know, time is just limited. Uh, so if you waste too much time uh, developing, you know, going and doing a lot of uh, startup ideas that had very little chance of succeeding, you're really wasting it, uh, wasting your, uh, your life's opportunity. So it's really important to actually knock out bad ideas and be without a good without an idea is better than to be with better than you know developing a company around a bad idea okay so it's better to be you know saying i'm looking or looking for a good idea than to say that you know i'm already working on an idea and if it's a bad idea right which yeah go ahead yeah no, it's actually, there's a process. And that's what we'll cover in the next 20 minutes. Because we spent six weeks uh, studying that last uh, course. In but, uh, you know, uh, we'll just do a quick one here to show you the uh, mechanics of how to do it. Yeah? So, you know, you got your idea, right? So now we're trying to build your business. So business is really an organization that creates delivers and captures the value. You get the profits, right? That's in a nutshell what a, a, a company is. And there are only four things or main areas in a company. The customers who are gonna buy your product, the product or the offer that you're gonna make, the organization and the infrastructure and the raw material and the manufacturing that's gonna be needed to do it, and then the finance side. So there's only four blocks that are important in a company, that, that are really part of the company. And the business model that we are talking about is really how these four areas interact with each other to give you something that is scalable, repeatable, and profitable, right? So these four areas have to interact with each other, and that's what the business model is all about. And, hmm? Offer is the product, the product that you offer to the customer, yeah, yeah. So, so for the first, so the thing that we have to do is to take that idea and do the first two steps, which is how do you, which is customer discovery and customer validation, right? Those are the two things that you're doing. And then you have to keep iterating and keep changing your idea or thought or plan or whatever till it hangs together, right? Till the customer who's going to buy the product and uh, the, uh, the, the, his confidence in using your product is validated, right? So till those two things are figured out, you hang into the, in that area. You don't move to the next step, which is execution step. Uh, the diff what happens right here between search and execution is writing your business plan. 
and raising money and making, putting a stake in the ground that, okay, I'm going to build a company, I'm going to quit my job, job at IBM or Cisco or wherever, and I'm going to do it. So you write your business plan after you've got it all hanging together. And, and, and the answer is uh, both are okay depending on the situation. You know, so you'll have to judge whether with the POC, whether you need to go all the way to a POC before a customer is willing to sign up to be an alpha or a beta customer, or whether he's willing to start making commitments to using your product based on just a presentation. So to me, that is the crux of the issue. You know, is the customer eyes lighting up and is he excited and eager? And obviously, as I said, as we had talked last time, you know, only three to 5% of the customers that you're gonna call, so one in 20, who's actually even a legitimate alpha or beta customer. So then we call them early evangelists, right? And so these people, if their eyes light up and if you can do it with just a presentation and a commitment, of getting this thing done, uh, done if he's interested in the product, that is good, uh, you know, then, then it's good enough. But sometimes you might need a POC. Yeah. yeah, so the question was like, how do we do it with some of these new social media kind of companies or consumer kind of plays, et cetera? So I think like, you know, even there, you know, you can do a, pres if you look at most of the funding ideas in Kickstarter or whatever, you know, they put up a picture of it or a demo of it or a model or some results or some, you know, uh, feedback of, you know, how people like it or don't like it. Uh, I don't know if you, all, you guys saw, somebody posted this thing called an undress. How many guys saw that undress video? Isn't that fantastic? I think I posted it, right? I think it was just fantastic that with just a video, they ended up getting 7 million views. And instead of hitting a target of $22,000, which was their target, they raised $600,000 with a video. But it's such a fantastic video, right? It's, and I bet they just shot it with a camcorder. I don't think it was not even professionally made or anything. It was just shot with a camcorder, edited with, you know, some home uh, video editing software. But the honesty and the a nice way that they said the story, like, you know, I felt like also, you know, uh, ordering the product and just giving it to my nieces and whatever. So, so the... What is customer creation? Huh? Okay, so basically once you go into execution mode, um, you already figured out what type of customer is interested in buying your product through your customer discovery. Now, if there's only one customer that fits that model, there is no customer creation. But if there is 10,000 of them who f have the same kind of need as the customer that you discovered, now you have to figure out how to reach them. You go through marketing, through PR, through blogs, through whatever. So you create your customer base. And there's a whole marketing process, and that's what marketing is all about, right? So that's customer creation. And company building, we know, we, we're talking about. Yes. Uh, the, the answer is that there is, it can be a few days. It might be two years. It could be anything. Yeah, but you depends. definitely do not want to move to execution phase if you cannot get past the... Uh, requirements of doing a customer validation that you're comfortable with, it, that you're willing to, you know, you, you bet your job and your co-founder's job and your reputation uh, when you raise money. It depends on your passion for what you believe in. Um, there are many people who have worked at it for three to five years. I mean, for Selectica, the founder, uh, kept going five years. He had five years he went with same it. Same software. Um, you know, my belief is that, you know, he kind of could not form his team 
because if he had formed his team, uh, he could have been five years ahead, and instead of a five billion dollar exit, it would be a twenty five billion dollar exit. It was such a good product if it had, if it had had those extra five years. Uh, I don't think there's any clear cut answer. Sometimes it just your co founding team, you know, just happens. You know, because you came up with the idea together and you were complementary or whatever. And sometimes, you know, as it happened in my second company, uh, Selectica, this guy took five years over and over again, you know, trying to figure out. And unfortunately, the market just was taking off and he was still not getting off the ground because he did not have a team with him, right? Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, but basically at the end of it, you've got to write your business plan. Once you've got a validated uh, business, et cetera, uh, idea, et cetera. And then the question that I think you asked was, how do you know your idea is a good idea worth committing to or not? And for that, you do this thing called a business model. So this business model, you know, is basically nine key building blocks. And they all have feedback loops with each other. These nine building blocks have feedback loops with each other. And your idea is, I, I really look at it as an entrepreneur is basically God for his business model. <laughs> because the entrepreneur's idea breeds life into his BMC or the business model. Business model. His, his idea breeds life into it, right? Because we ourselves are feedback loop of a hundred different things. But this is just a, business, a feedback loop of nine different blocks. And if you look at the right hand side, it's all about customer and reaching the customer. So this is all about the customer, right? We talked about the four elements. Offer, customer, infrastructure, and the financial. So this is the customer. This is your offer, which is your value proposition, whether it's a software product, hardware product, services, whatever. So that's your off offer. These are the activities that you have to do. So the activities are the infrastructure. It can be physical infrastructure, it can be virtual infrastructure, it can be outsource infrastructure, it can be partners, whatever. So that's your infrastructure. And then just revenue costs, right? So, but these nine blocks essentially are a representation of a company. So now you've just taken a piece of paper and on it you've written down what your value proposition is. Then you've written down who are your customers? How, how are you going to reach them? It's just through the channels. What kind of relationship you're going to have with them one-on-one? -on -one, or you're going to have it through a, through, uh, through a marketing approach or whatever, or a sales direct sales approach. Then how are you going to build it together? Are you going to hire engineers? Are you going to outsource it? You know, whether you're going to need a manufacturing plant, whether you're going to need whatever, whether partners are going to provide some key elements of the solution. And then what is going to cost and what is going to be the revenue and, you know, whether this whole thing is going to stick together or not, right? So, so basically the B BMC or the business model canvas is an easy way to take an idea, create a virtual company on paper without actually building products and things like that. Uh, and then uh, be sure whether it works. And uh, is, uh, you know, the VCs, some of the biggest and most successful VCs, have basically decided to use their money power to overwhelm the marketplace and to grab and create a monopolistic situation. So uh, in general, for almost every other market segment except social media and some of that stuff that's going that that's really become very hot. Um, you you really are not going to find investors who are going to be willing to take a billion dollars worth of losses before you make your first penny of profit, which is what Facebook did, Google did, etc. There are very few market uh, companies for which investors are going to be willing to. 
take that kind of a risk. But uh, so don't, I think for the company that you're thinking of, try to become profitable and cash flow positive as fast as possible. 99% of the time, that is what Raj is saying is true, 99.9%. Yeah, 99.9%, uh, .9%, you know, focus on profitability as fast as you can get there, uh, or at least cash flow positive as fast as you can get there, and profitable as fast as you can get there. And, um, you know, if you get to that point and you are still have a good BMC, which means a good value proposition, a good customer validation and a customer acceptance and all that stuff, uh, then you can convince people to part with, a, invest a lot of money in your company, go into a loss because you know you can come back with a monstrous, you know, uh, explosion of revenue, right? And profitability. So... Uh, but the point, the point is um, what you're doing really, remember that revenues and profits, they are side effects of something far more significant. And that is that problem that you're solving for customers. Um, yeah. you, uh, you, know, you are fulfilling a need. You know, oftentimes it could be a pain point or you know, they say, are you solving a pain? Are you solving uh, you know, a, um, you know, a minor, a, you know, it's a, a vitamin or a painkiller. Um, make sure that you're solving a hard problem that the customer is facing. Because then revenues and profits will be a natural side effect. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a wonderful question. And, and, uh, but I, my feeling is that the answer is going to be very specific to different industries. You know, it's going to be very, very specific. But it's a brilliant question. Uh, that was uh, covered by Raj um, uh, in that uh, earlier slide where you know you went through that process of pivot uh, so that is that that is the formula because that is in that in that loop there you in, the, in that validation loop the customer validation loop that is exactly what you're trying to solve yeah. whether this is a pain whether it's repeatable you and you're not doing it with just one uh, use case you're you're going to talk to at least 3 or 4 customers but again those are use case instances it's not science. It's a scientific process. It's a, you know, that's how experiments are conducted, right? You, you, you're conducting an experiment in the marketplace. You, and you do a deductive logic that, you know, if it works in two cases or three cases, then it'll work. In okay, let's, uh, if you category. don't mind, we can. It's, it's a very good question, but uh, yeah. I have not seen anything as yet uh, that focuses exactly on analytical way of analyzing CIO's pains or something like that, or consumer pains, right? So, go ahead. Yeah. And then your job is to go ahead and make it real, quantify it as much as possible, make it as real as possible. Anyway, so uh, th these slides are with you, uh, and you, know, you can go through this. Uh, it goes into more detail on every uh, box. But the key is to bring it all together, which is, which is like, you know, how do you understand your business model and how it's going to work, right? And how do you develop the insights? And that can only be done through real world experiments. You have to go and call potential customers. I found that my IIT students said that that was the hardest thing for them. They all could do a BMC. And they whipped out BMCs overnight and beautiful BMCs because they can, they're wonderful at cloning in it, these IIT engineers, uh, students, right? And so they came up with beautiful BMCs and, you know, I had them go ahead and call at least 10 customers. And what's interesting is that the next class they come and say that, you know, their BMC just fell apart after the first call because everything that they'd imagined about the customer need, what, that he would buy, ta -da 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 -da, everything turned out to be false. And what's interesting is that a lot of them ended up pivoting and changing their whole idea and BMC and business model and so on. And that's really how 
that company that won the IIM award because you know they started off with one idea which they thought was hot they actually built a whole app etc but the minute they started talking to real customers or potential real customers the whole you know the the real, the world gave them the feedback and they accepted the feedback pivoted changed the direction and then they got a real company going yeah so uh, but really the whole idea of doing this bmc is so that you and your co-founders really start putting down things on paper it's very easy to think that i'm going to de- develop the world's greatest search engine and i'm going to become a billionaire right you can everybody can imagine that but you have to then go ahead and if you start putting it down on paper you'll soon realize that maybe it's not that good idea to try and develop the next great search engine right but or the next amazon or the next facebook or the next linkedin or whatever it is yeah. i think it's the best idea possible you know so the question was that you know what about me to ideas if something is working here why not have a kickstarter in india why not have you know baidu in china why don't have why not have a alibaba in china if amazon is working here you know why not have a 10 cent you know for the complimentary stuff here so i think it's brilliant to do that because a heck of a lot of startups uh uh become successful because you know they they did a me too idea now why does why do these me too ideas companies uh, succeed so quickly tell me they still have to do the bmc guess what lot of the nine building blocks have been validated right the biggest challenge for a startup is you know what features to put in your product how much to sell it for you know what should be the sales channel what should be the sales approach you know uh you know what should be the returns policy what should be this that 101 questions so if you look at my to the first and the second company opti and selectica opti was a me too because i just went into the same market that my parent company my previous company was in chips and technologies now it doesn't mean that it's going to be very easy in some other ways because guess who i face in competition the minute i go out in the marketplace my my parent company the parent company has got 200 million dollars in the bank i got half a million in the bank or none or, or less um they've got you know four years worth of patents i got zero patents and maybe i'm infringing on some of the patents without knowing it i'm infringing on some of the patents or they can say that you know hey you engineers were designing the product at chips now you're designing it at opti did you take any code like avanti and things like that right so you know we had to face you know lawsuits competition uh, all kinds of stuff we had to face in a me to company right so so how do you know that amazon does not have a china patent for some elements but the thing is that you know Alibaba had a special relationship with the Chinese government which ended up giving them a protected environment where Amazon could not come in and build an Amazon right so so the thing is that me too companies have their own challenges but on the other hand the BMC challenges have been reduced dramatically the BMC risks have been reduced but there are other risks that have popped up right so you, while with Selectica totally new technology new market new evangelizing new everything but our biggest problem was how much should we sell it for so when we first launched the product uh when the customer said how what's the price and the biggest number i could think of was $25000 and um you know the customer looked at me funny and i thought he, he I said is the price too high and uh he says he no but the price was too low by a factor of 10 <laughs> so 
actually, <laughs> because he was expecting a number in the quarter million dollar range, and I gave $25,000. And I paid through my nose by charging $25,000 to the customer because very soon the customer wanted this feature, this feature, this feature, this feature, because that's what he expects to have in an enterprise software product. And before I knew it, you know, I was spending 10 times as much to service that one customer with his specific requirements. And I was miss losing the whole market. And finally, I had to tell the customer that, you know, I cannot uh, satisfy his needs and offer to return the money and everything, which I think I had to return the money. But uh, he lost a year and he hated me for that. And, you know, that was a disaster because we underpriced the product by 10x uh, by not knowing what to price it at, right? It's only after I hired my competitor's sales guy, VP of sales I hired, that I figured out what the right pricing for the product should be. So, so, so the thing is that you know, when you're doing a BMC for a brand new market, uh, for a brand new idea, uh, a lot of mistakes uh, and and, and uh, trial and error has to happen continuously, and you have to be very alert uh, to read the tea leaves, to read you know what's going on, to find out you know how to go ahead and price and feature set and promise and contract and all that good stuff. But basically, you're doing all these experiments to develop these insights, and then you you know validate it again by going out of the building, develop positioning, and then verifying. Round and round and round. You keep doing it till, till you're ready to. And then once you've done all of that, you go ahead and say, okay, I'm, I'm done with it, and I'm going to write a business plan, and I'm going to start raising money, right? <coughs> okay, so let's take a 10-minute break till 8.30, and we'll move into team building and so on. So this is six weeks of uh, BMC stuff that we did. We wrapped it up in 40 minutes. <laughs> so... Uh, but, you know, I think you'll learn a lot more by watching the videos and doing everything. Okay? Okay. I think we've got 14 guys who are burning the midnight oil in India. <laughs> so let's, let's get it going here. Huh? It's a day for them. It is day for them. Day is, their day has started. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the same portal, ESV 101. I'll just add um, all of you guys to class one also, so you can have access to the material. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. Totally. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I'll try to fix it. I don't know what the problem is, but my document... Yeah, get cranking on it, yeah. No, it should work, yeah. Okay, uh, let's get started. Nagesh, <laughs> I know your name. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do anything bad. <laughs> and it's being broadcast. Okay. So uh, let's go into uh, team building and uh, company uh, and company culture. And so as as we said uh, during the intro that you know finding your co-founders and finding your first hires and then finding your first executive team, all these are very, very stressful uh, and very, very kind of crucial decisions that you will make uh, for your company. I think uh, every entrepreneur who's built his company will tell you the same message. So, you know, here are kind of uh, some of the points that you know, a lot of successful entrepreneurs. And uh, the one that I kind of <clears throat> leverage the most is this guy called uh, Guy Kawasaki. Yes. Yeah. So he's written this book called Art of the Start, right? How many guys have read it or? Yeah, I think it's a Bible. Okay, guys, I think it's a total Bible. It's a very small Bible, that too, thank you. Uh, not like a big Peter Drucker book or something. Uh, but, you know, just to the point, you know, he gives you the formula. 
And obviously, you know, no formula can be applied directly, but essentially it gets you halfway to, to wherever you want to get to in your startup thing. So uh, number one point that he makes is, and that you know, I would make too, is that it has to be complementary skills. You know, all the co-founders cannot be just engineers or just marketing people or whatever. I mean, yes, they are your friend circle, they are your ones that you're most comfortable with, but essentially that's not what's going to help you build your company because you know you have to have so many other somebody has got to be doing the accounting, somebody's got to be doing the sales, somebody and you're going to need people with the complementary personalities, interests, skills, uh, and so on, right? So, so this complementary skills, uh, and that's what I've also found hard is, it's hard to find the people with complementary skill and build, have confidence in them. And uh, uh, just because you don't know how to measure, their, measure them, right? You don't know how to measure whether they're good or bad. You, you don't have the informal networks to cross-check them. Um, uh, you know, I tell everybody that the most difficult person to hire is a salesperson because every salesperson should be able to sell an engineer. <laughs> and you're the engineer. <laughs> and so they should have absolutely no trouble selling themselves to you. Because I found that, you know, if, whenever I did my interviews for sales guys, I liked every one of them. <laughs> every one of them was, was good because, you know, they are so good at interpersonal relationship and at breaking the ice. I mean, every one of them uh, is instantly hireable. Not that they should be hired, <laughs> but they're hireable, right? Because they, they, they have the ability to sell themselves to you. Obviously, if they can't sell to you, then they should not be hired in the first place. But most good salespeople, if they've been in sales for five, 10 years, they can easily blow away uh, most of most first-time entrepreneurs, uh, first-time CEOs, and so on. I mean, you guys are go you know, going to say, how did I end up with this person? <laughs> and, and it's going to be very expensive. I, I, I think that's an excellent piece of advice. Actually, I give a couple of pieces of advice to you know, all the IIT students and the early entrepreneurs, which is, uh, you know, basically I told you that in my IIT Bombay class, there were 250 students, right? And I said, look, I don't know um, which 20% uh, of you is going to be super successful in 10 years, but I can guarantee that 50 out of your 250 people is going to be super successful in 10 years. Multimillionaire or Karodpati or, you know, vice president at, you know, Google India or whatever it is, but 20% of you are going to be super successful, but I can't tell you who are, which of you, 250 is going to be that. I said in 20 years, half of you are going to be successful, super successful. And I said the other half, better make the connections with this half <laughs> right now <laughs> if they are going to be successful. <laughs> if you don't make your connection right now, uh, he's not going to take your phone call after he's successful. Because successful people, everybody knows, are, are, are worth you know, befriending and connecting through LinkedIn and everything else. But, you know, Connect with them right now. And I think the same thing is true here too. Like, you know, I would expect that, you know, within probably five years, at least, you know, out of this class of 40, 10 of you are going to be amazingly successful. Does anybody have a doubt that 10 out of these 40 people are going to be super successful and you wish you had connected with them and, and made them you know, part of your network. Because, you know, one way to succeed is to write the coattails of successful people, right? And then you'll learn a lot and then you can start your own thing and people write your coattail. But the point is that, you know, uh, it's, it's such a people-driven success story in, in the valley and in the entrepreneurship business that uh, 
you have to build your networks uh, early. Uh, when, when you know, especially schools, great because egos are much smaller and people have got more time, and you're doing these joint projects together, and you know, everybody is aspiring to be successful. So that's the time to make the connections. So so that's one thing. And the second thing is um, uh, to build your cross-disciplinary networks, right? That is incredibly important. I mean, if you're sitting at IBM or Cisco, and I was sitting at Intel, you know, uh, basically great places to make friends with, I was in the marketing department, so engineering, you know, product support, customer marketing, sales, uh, regional managers, uh, all kinds of people are people that I can connect with and uh, you know, build up my database. Another great place is uh, the customers that you call on. Intel calls on Dell, it calls on Compaq, it calls on you know, IBM, it calls on HP, it calls on Hyundai, you know, Samsung, whatever. It calls on all these big, big companies. And, uh, you know, great place to build up, uh, you know, a, a network which is global, which is across the, you know, Fortune uh, 500 or even the Global 2000. You can build up your database of, uh, of uh, you know, important people. Uh, like, you know, companies like Intel, et cetera, they always have these 10, 20 person groups coming from Korea, Japan, et cetera, to discuss, you know, the next generation, whatever. And, uh, and typically, if you're in marketing or engineering or whatever, you're going to be called in to make a presentation. And, you know, a lot of people would just come in, make the presentation, and just walk out. And what I would do is I would take a stack of cards and give one to every one of them. And by definition, they give you one of their cards. So you automatically have, you know, 20 cards at Samsung, certainly. And some might be director-level people, some might be mid-level people, but within 10 years, some of those mid-level people might be directors too or VPs too, right? So, so uh, and, you know, our career in technology and technology entrepreneurship is going to be a good 35 to 40 years. So a lot of people that you connect with will succeed and will succeed greatly. And uh, I'll tell you a lot of people that, uh, you know, I knew at Intel, you know, some, you know, ended up staying at Intel. Other people, you know, had careers at Atmel or, or became entrepreneurs or whatever and or joined uh, companies like HP and they became such wonderful ways to break into these companies and, uh, you know, get them to... Uh, be your betas and alphas and so on. So, <clears throat> so I would say that you know, um, uh, build, start building your rolodex and your networks. Um, uh, 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 you know, so that uh, you'll be able to pull together the most effective team, right? As you go along, uh, the biggest issue that that that's important that becomes kind of the first stress point <laughs> is now who should be the CEO? The guy who came up with the idea and the guy who recruited the co-founders or one of the co-founders, right? I mean, that becomes a highly stressful thing because, you know, essentially uh, CEO is where a lot of visibility is going to be there, a lot of action is going to be around the CEO, uh, and you know, in initially it's a flat world, like all, all co-founders are the same. But everybody knows that whoever has the title of the CEO over one year, two year, three years is going to get you know, uh, the most visibility and so on, and is going to be the most influential person in the company and so on. And, um, is going to get exposed to more and more uh, circles outside the company, etc. So, uh, you know, people would love to be the CEO, right? I mean, some people would rather be the CTO and if they're very technically oriented or whatever. But 
in general, you know, founders would like to be the CEO. But is it right for the guy who came up with the idea to be the CEO? Any thoughts? Hmm? Not necessarily. Depending on the personality, of course. Okay, personality of the person. What personality is important for a CEO? You should be well connected and able to talk to others and present the, somebody else's ideas properly to others. Yeah, the, the company's idea. Yeah. <laughs> Praveen, yeah. I believe it should be a visionary and inspire people. That's one. The visionary is the guy who came up with the idea. Right. And he brought in the co-founder who might be a marketing person or a or management person or whatever. Yeah. So so for CEO, I believe inspiring team is a critical Okay, CEO. inspiring a team is a good one. And second one is decision making, I think is very big. Well, remember the decision making in a early stages is very different than decision-making afterwards. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Decision-making uh, in the early stages has to really be consens you know, consensus-driven. And it's easy at the early stages. And it's easy because you know, everybody's in the same boat and everybody is together a lot, right? Uh, but there are some other characteristics which I think uh, people have not gotten to as yet. Huh? Growth. Growth. You should be able to grow the company from whatever, right? From this X amount of the, to a, a much larger uh, amount of revenues. The bottom line should increase business. Size. Yeah, but I think I'm looking for personality traits. So, okay. Communication and presentation, very important. Yep. You will be the person in the startup who will be facing the investors, press, everybody. Yes. So he will be the focal point of contact for, for building the image of the company. Yep. So CEO has to be the super marketing guy or you know somebody who is really able to market not only the idea of the company, but you know the company image and everything. Yep. So the communication is the key. And plus, he'll be the one communicating to the board, to the investors, to the employees, everybody. So the one having the biggest communication chain open would be the Who's got the very key who's natural communicator and who can communicate with all the different types that we talked about, employees, partners, customers, investors, whatever. Sales and charismatic person. Sales and charismatic is another very, very good point. And charisma is important because during the early stages, uh, charisma is how you get credibility. To get credibility uh, is not that easy. But if you're charismatic speaker, uh, you, people automatically trust you that, you know, uh, this person, you know, has, is really uh, some, somebody who's naturally trustworthy. And uh, his charisma is the reason why people will believe in the idea of the company in the first place, right? Any other? Hmm? Is it the charisma? Looking at the political landscape and how the CEO has to navigate a lot of these uh, various uh, landmines outside, with, be it with the prospective investors or with the first line of customers, uh, and in trying to draw a panel between the corporate world and the political world. So do you think it's auditorship, or is it much more than that? Well, I think I, I really don't like to use the word politics because uh, Politics comes much later in the life of a company. Uh, to me, it's really kind of being able to, you know, communicate the vision of the company so that, you know, people take the company seriously. Connecting to the audience about... The audience, uh, about uh, and, and getting people to actually act on what you want them to act on. Because that is the next step after connecting to the audience. Because if a CEO can just connect with the audience, but you know, people don't act based on what he talked about, then you know, uh, we have a problem, right? I think like, would you guys think that Modi would be a good CEO? Yes. 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 And why is he a good CEO? He's, he's acting like a CEO of India right now. <laughs> no, but why? Why? why, why? <laughs> How about Obama? 
Yeah. 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 Well, I think Modi is easier compared to Obama because I think Obama has got other uh, uh, other baggage. But you know, yeah. Can I ask? Is Mukesh Ambani a charismatic person? No. 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 I mean, I agree if he's a charismatic, he's a good orator, the chances of being successful is high. But it's not a necessary trait. I think for us to be the CEO? No, to, to, be, to be a charismatic person. I think one more thing required for charisma is competence. Once you have competence, others respect you. And yeah. by the, that respect of others gives you charisma. This competence. Thing. So how do you yeah. get others to respect you? And that comes from your own competence and own self-confidence with you. Self-confidence insight, but more, even more than that, competence which others respect. Yeah. I think a, a CEO has to lead by example. You know? So I mean, there will be times even when the company is just being founded where you know, a, a small skirmish can lead to completely the company just scuttling out. You know? Yeah. And, uh, most CEOs are, are, you know, they might, I don't know how good they are technically, but they are definitely very good at people skills, and they, they try to keep their flock together. Yep. And you know, leading by example in times of crisis. Yep. And and, and you know, getting the best out of the the people around you is one of the big hallmarks of being a very good leader. So one of the uh, very important skills that a CEO needs, which Raj has, he was my CEO for. A long time um, that you have not mentioned. You have you you've mentioned the outward characteristics of a CEO, but uh, some of the inward inward looking characteristics of a CEO are he has a finger on the the money uh, and and you know the the cash levels in the company. Uh, someone who is very good at operations and uh, especially in early stage when money is scarce to manage that money and make sure the right message is conveyed to the people. Uh, and at the front, at, to the employees, but at the back end also, to make sure that money is coming in and the company is afloat all the time. So the CEO, uh, one of the important uh, skills for a CEO is uh, good operational skills. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so, you know, and, and there's an article right, uh, right in, the, in that portal about the CEO characteristics. And this is uh, quite interesting to realize that a startup, the objective of a startup is to do something that other people have not done before, right? Other people, if it was obvious that something is a good, viable business, other companies would have done it, right? But a startup sees the world like a schizophrenic or as a neurotic person or whatever, somebody with a mind distortion, he sees the world slightly different. You see, and, and you know, that gives him, that's his vision. He sees the world different. He sees the opportunities that other people can't see. You know, so basically the CEO has to be the person who can convince others that this crazy vision that this company has got is quite sane. <laughs> In fact, it's brilliant, right? That's the job of the CEO. The job of the CEO is to convince <coughs> the world, uh, everybody, starting with the employees, to the investors, to the customers, etc., that what appears crazy is actually brilliant, right? Otherwise, why would you have a startup? Because otherwise, big companies would have done it. Existing companies in the field would have done it. So essentially he's saying, according to that article, he's saying that, you know, basically the CEO should be able to communicate the reality distortion in the right, in, in, in the positive way, right? Should be able to communicate, you know, this world that is, he's seeing differently, his company's seeing differently, and how they're going to be changing the world is going to be different. Why that is actually the right way to see the world, right? So that's his job. So his job, as you said, 
needs to be like a super communicator, empathetic, uh, articulate, uh, convincing, charismatic, you know, uh, obviously has good credibility from his past uh, uh, performance or experience or whatever, but it's that ability to be able to communicate why this new vision of the world or new vision of how business is going to succeed or the problems are going to be solved is good, right? Is the right thing. So uh, most uh, people are going to have a hard time articulating effectively this thing. So the CEO really has to be that person in, in, in the group. Because otherwise, you know, if the CEO has to turn to the CTO or the VP of engineering to explain why something is going to succeed in the marketplace, uh, basically the company loses credibility. If the CEO cannot communicate it, the company loses credibility and the investors are not going to invest because the VP of engineering says, this is the way the world should work. The CEO needs to be able to say why the company is going to be successful, right? So, so, so that's, uh, you know, I think based on the feedback questions and the responses, I think you put it all together and I think you're beginning to see that, you know, the CEO is not the person with the idea, but the best person among the three or four co-founders who has the ability to Get that obviously, if he doesn't have the maturity, emotion, EQ. If he doesn't have the EQ, if he doesn't have the personality, if he's a jerk, he may be a great communicator, but he's a jerk. You know, like George Bush Jr. or somebody like that. But you know, you definitely, you know, should trade off to maybe the. Somebody else can be the CEO <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, I personally think that ultimately the CEO uh, will have to develop all the additional traits besides being communicator to being somebody who runs the company wisely, who runs, makes the decisions in the right way, creates the right company culture, uh, uh, takes care of customers the proper way, you know, is, runs it ethically. All of those things better be there in place. Uh, otherwise, the company will basically run into significant problems pretty quickly. Because every time a new CEO comes in, uh, actually, in my opinion, you're risking the whole company. Uh, when we were running Opti, one of the reasons that Opti got into huge problems that we could never recover, recover from. And essentially, I think uh, it wiped out the future of Opti, uh, was that um, after we became public, you know, we had a, a CEO who was Chinese who was totally inarticulate. He could not say one sentence straight. So during the IPO, uh, he would just say the, f we would put up the first slide. He will just say, welcome. Thank you for coming to the Opti IPO presentation and sit down. And then I would do the whole presentation and then he'll say, thank you. So, so that's how we did the whole IPO for Opti. That was it because he was totally inarticulate. Huh? Yeah. He was the founder. He had lots of other great uh, characteristics and traits, but he was, you know, from China, Taiwan, and it was totally inarticulate in, in English, right? So that's, you know, so uh, this is how we decided to take the company public. And, uh, but there was huge pressure as soon as we took the company public to swap him out, right? To bring in uh, a, a name brand CEO, because we were worth $400 million. You know, $70, $80 million in the bank, which was a big number 20 years ago. And, um, and we're running this public company and uh, semiconductor company. So we did a retained search and we found somebody from 
the president of National Semiconductor. He was running a, like a billion dollar you know, division of National Semiconductor and we brought him in to be the CEO of uh, Opti and uh, that was our kiss of death. Because basically for one year, not a single decision was made. And you know, semiconductor industry is very fast moving industry, especially for small companies. So not a single decision was made, hard decision about to, you know, which would, which would uh, have kept Opti successful. Uh, it became a very political company where previously, like, you know, the founders were controlling the company. So, you know, we had a layer of execs and layer of uh, everything. We had almost 200 plus employees, but it all worked like clockwork. And, but the minute um, we brought in a, a, a big name CEO, it became a political, you know, it was worse than like, you know, uh, Shah Jahan's court, Mughal court, you know, it was like, <laughs> Everybody is like, you know, focused on politics rather than, uh, you know, and hiding information. And it used to be a totally open, transparent company. And it just became a totally different company. And essentially, you know, uh, a year later, we had to fire him. And, um, you know, again, the founders took back control. It was too late when you lose one year in the marketplace. So uh, I would say that, you know, uh, CEO is... Definitely something that, you know, it would be great if the same person can take it all the way up because he knows how the company was built at every stage, what the weaknesses are, what the strengths are, has the relationships with the key customers and the key partners. So it's great if the CEO can grow with the company. And, uh, but, uh, you know, if they have to change, they have to change. And most companies do change every two or three years, they change the CEO. Yes. Um, Intel does two in a box a lot. Like, you know, every general manager has got an operating general manager and a marketing, sales, uh, visionary general manager, right? So strategic general. So Intel does two in a box a lot, but uh, in general, I think it's very difficult to do because in big companies for two big egos to, to work together is not that easy. I think you're just creating a complication for the whole organization about how to report into this kind of the CEO office, right? So a lot of big companies find it very hard to find one person who can span operating, detail-oriented, accounting, P&L-oriented stuff, and doing the strategizing, the outbound stuff, and so on. But... Um, I really think it's, you know, one person is the way to go. Most companies go one person, yeah. Sir, lately, uh, our own business review has repeatedly coming up with something called emotional intelligence and weight control. EQ, EQ. Emotional quality, EQ. EQ versus IQ, right? Yeah, so EQ is all the emotional stuff, right? I mean, empathy, your know, relationship, interpersonal relationship, and all that, because... Over, over and over again, they found that, you know, as you become a successful company, the, if the leadership does not have EQ and is just an analytic IQ person, uh, the quality of decisions are not going to be that good. Sometimes a lot of quality of decisions depend on kind of an understanding of human beings. Yeah, how human beings work. Uh, because everything is done through human beings. We may have computers and everything, but it's still, you have to work through human beings to make things happen in a company. So, Well, the thing is that in the early stages, actually, believe it or not, the title doesn't matter because in the first year or so or two years or so, essentially every decision is consensus decision. There is no CEO doesn't take a decision if the other two guys don't support him. So... Uh, really, uh, the title is just a name card. It's just a business card. So, you know, especially if uh, typically even the stock options and so on might be pretty much uh, equally distributed. The amount of salary that they take, the CEO, the CTO, the VP of engineering may all take, or the marketing guy might all take equal salary. So, 
there is no extra benefit that the CEO is getting from a financial standpoint or decision making or whatever. It's just the business card. Now, what happens three years from now or five years from now, the path's evolution, the growth path is totally different, right? And um, then what happens is that uh, you end up with, you know, uh, people getting very upset with each other because one person gets all the limelight. And then they, get the, they have the same salary, they get the same compensation, but the spouses look at it and say, you know, how come this guy is getting, he, he's so famous in San <laughs> Thai and he's so famous in Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Exactly, it was your idea, your technology, and but the spouses get very upset if your husband is not the CEO <laughs> or your wife is not the CEO. So, huh? Time to the CEO. Well, no, it, it it really causes a huge amount of heartburn, and that's just a fact of life. So. I have not succeeded, so don't ask me. <laughs> Wherever possible, try to just make it equal. Unless there is a specific reason for it not to be equal. If, if, if uh, two or three or four people are getting together and everybody is sacrificing their jobs or whatever, uh, just give it equal because it reduces so much heartburn later on that uh, it is not worth it to have 5% extra or 5% less. Uh, because ultimately, if the pie becomes really big, because you did not have some heartburn and politics and all those things, um, essentially everybody wins. So, so to the, as far as possible, you know, I think it's okay to let go five, ten percent. You know, if the, if you if you become the CEO or whatever, you can say, look, we all take the same. You know, uh, now I'm not saying that you know that's going to work in every case, especially if the founder has put in five years and um, you know put in a lot of uh, personal money into it, or you know, if, it depends on the circumstance a little bit, but. Uh, to a large extent, if you can um, just divvy it up equally um, uh, with giving here a little bit or, or you know, getting some benefit, extra, uh, et cetera, uh, I think it's fine. I, I think ultimately everybody's a winner because, you know, if the company really succeeds and one person makes $37 million and the other person makes 25, it really doesn't matter. Right? Yeah, that is actually very easy to do. Because nobody takes, if you get one third of the company, you basically get stock options for one third of the company, which will rest over four years. So if you leave after two years, you get half of the one third of the company. And then there'll be further dilution anyway, that the people who stayed at the company are going to participate in. So I think that's an easy, form, easy problem to solve. Yeah, that, that's already solved. You understand the No, it's not vested 100%. It does not vested 100%. It vested over four years. The formula in the valley is four years, and it'll vest. Now, if somebody is bringing in patents or technology or whatever or something, you might give them instant vesting of, you know, one-eighth of that stock or quarter of the stock or something. But most of the value add, if it's going to come from the four years of work, then basically it'll vest over four years. I, I don't think they're that critical about it. I, I think, um, you know, they might say it's a weak CEO or something, typically. But, uh, you know, if the CEO is willing to stand up and explain his logic in the right way, I think it should be fine. Yeah, so there are many ways to solve that problem. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I, there was a nice article that was uh, forwarded to me by actually Vast today. And uh, even, you know, Reid Hoffman and Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, everybody thinks that he was a single founder. 
but uh, he basically talks about the importance of networks, right? Importance of co-founders and so on. Um, okay, uh, I want to give Vas at least 20, 30 minutes. So um, I think on first hires, I think the points are all made here, which is, you know, people, sh it's not just the founders who should believe in the company's dream, even the people that you hire, especially the first hire, should believe in the dream of the company. They're not coming in just for salary and so on. They're coming in because they want to achieve what the company is trying to achieve. It's always hire the smart person, the person that has got the ability to get the job done. Uh, it should always be the A team. People should be better than the ones that you are as far as you can find them. Uh, you should have the confidence to find them and so on. And uh, just as we made the mistake of hiring a big organization president, don't make it. You know, ultimately, if the person that you're hiring does not have the startup uh, genetic build, uh, material, and a startup genetic material is essentially ability to create, you know, make something out of nothing. You know, ability to um, uh, uh, establish new processes, new businesses, uh, new, 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 new ways of doing things. Ability to be, you know, frugal, have a can-do attitude, make things, you know, solve the problem, uh, get his hands dirty. Unless that is there, uh, better not to hire that person from the big company. So. To me, the biggest warning when I hire somebody from a big company is will he be able to adapt to what is really required for the small company to succeed? That is, it's not the same, right? So, so that is a key point of the first hire. Uh, executive team um, and then the founders, hugely complex issue because typically, the exec team that is formed are people with superb, you know, VP of marketing ability, superb VP of sales ability, superb COO ability, superb, you know, they come in with 10, 20 years of experience specialized in a particular field. Founders, even though they're doing the job, are generalists. You know, they, are, they might be great engineers, but they're doing the account VP of accounting's job, right? So essentially at some point, the company migrates from the founders managing departments to execs managing the departments. And these are external hires that you brought in. Now, huge amount of, they know that, you know, their compensation compared to the founding team is like one-tenth automatically, maybe even one-twentieth. Uh, from a stock option. Salary-wise, they might get same or more, but from equity ownership, it's like drops by 10x, right? Uh, but they know they are very, very capable people. And in a sense, a lot of the new success of the company depends on this executive layer carrying the company along. Because the founders have reached the limit of capability. <laughs> Uh, in those specific functions, right? Uh, so, uh, for example, and this becomes very obvious quickly in the sales area, in the marketing area, even in the engineering area, you might have your founder who's a great CTO, but he can't run a big engineering team. So that requires organizational skills and training skills and uh, auditing skills and management skills and processes and cross-functional stuff and, you know, different... Uh, organizations across countries and so on. So, <clears throat> so basically, you bring in the exec layer uh, of people with solid, reputable experience in all these areas to start to start taking on responsibility of running the company and growing it. And you know, by this time, the company is going from ten million to one hundred million in two years, and huge. That's where the massive appreciation and value for everybody's equity happens. You know, the founders suddenly, equity becomes worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And 
the exact team that was brought in that really made it happen is getting a few million dollars, while these founders' equity value is going up by 50, 100 million dollars a year, year over year, because of the output of the execs, right? So creates a huge, um, in my opinion, a huge uh, uh, conflict. I mean, it's a subtle, it's, it's, it's not a conflict that is out in the open, but it is there, you know, uh, between the founders and the exec team. And um, it becomes even more complex because the board finds it easier to interact with smart execs from Harvard, Stanford, <laughs> you know, all of, because they, they, yes, they, they speak beautifully. They write beautifully. They have got industry reputation. They, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are very polished people. And they, they, they move and they network with moors and shakers at conferences and so on. And so your board loves the exec team and they would love to connect with them. But, and the founders um, find that, have to be, uh, find that, you know, they can sometimes get caught in the middle as, and, and, and uh, the whole thing becomes kind of a, a sticky situation to say the least, right? So, so in such a scenario, how does the founder hold on to the job? <laughs> no, no. So, so, so I think so. There are there are many there are many many ways to do it, but uh, none of them is uh, very pleasant. <laughs> uh, and you know, but I think I would say that you know the most important thing is that the founders have to realize that. The company is more important than them. That is, to me, the most important thing. And and that you know, uh, hmm? let go. Yeah, let go, or you know, give credit where credit is due, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, essentially move into a founder who could be running VP of engineering job and CTO can become a CTO. The CEO can become the chairman of the board. Uh, the CEO can become a chief evangelizer, or he can be a strategist, become a chief strategy officer. Uh, you know, all kinds of different options are available. He can become executive vice president uh, or executive chair or something, uh, vice chairman or something. So there are many options because, uh, but you know, the problem happens when founders end up fighting uh, a, a battle on both sides. They're fighting their exec team and they're fighting the board and they're stuck in the middle. And that's definitely a losing proposition because then the only option is to move you out, right? Rather than move you where you are still kind of a guru and a, and a venerable person in the, in, in the organization, so right? This is about the role, but what do you do about the 10x difference that you talk about? No, the 10x difference is going to stay. Yeah, That's okay. Executives are not going to be happy about that. How do you solve that? They are not, but you know, typically executives have already bought into the career path of being corporate people, where you know their comp is combination of salary plus bonus plus you know stock options that'll you know make them rich, but not in the super rich category. Uh, as you start hiring people, it becomes our company. It's not my company. And unless the transition happens in the founder, where it becomes our company rather than my company, and everything I'll do will be for the betterment of our company, even if it means me getting out, I think you know, you've done the right thing as a founder. So, so that's the most important thing, yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay, I think uh, we've got 25 minutes less uh, to go, but. Really, I think I, maybe I'll, I'll spend time on this slide because to me this is the most important slide uh, in, t in, 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 in startups, which is, you know, how do you manage a life 
where there's a crisis all the time. Every day there's a crisis. And multiple crises sometimes where, you know, which, which can result in your company's self-imploding, self-destructing, getting blown out of the water, all that good stuff. So how do you go ahead and create a process of managing crisis without everybody getting a heart attack, right? So, and it's important because, you know, uh, essentially we don't want to kill ourselves uh, running our companies. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'll spend more time on, on another, one, another uh, uh, class on this one because that's, uh, you know, we came up with certain approaches, solutions, which worked out uh, really well because, you know, we had all kinds of crises and I want to give you some specific examples of how we handled, you know, lawsuits or, custom, or product problems or uh, all kinds of, you know, discussions with board and all, all kinds of crisis situations. So we'll discuss that in the next class. Okay, so I'm just going to hand it over to Was. Thanks. Thank you. So, yeah, it was a great movie. Um, and, uh, you know, what that, that movie... Yeah. No, it's perfect. Right here, it's okay. So the movie is about uh, this great actor who came back from his. Hmm? No, no. See it. It. it it's not. Uh, it, it's about. It's about each of you because uh, whether you're doing your first startup, or whether you're doing your nth startup, it, as it turns out, this man was doing his nth startup, but. Um, you know, uh, he, he had done his first startup, which was very successful. And uh, he had all these magical powers because it was a successful startup. And, you know, you can see Raj did a couple of startups that went public. And you can see that he has these magical powers, right? Um, so um, I saw, you know, I saw in that guy, every one of you sitting here, because I think that you'll all do successful startups. Um, so you should go and see the movie. Um, um, so now, you know, talking to Bina uh, a little earlier, um, I had this conversation with her about, you know, repeatable, scalable, and profitable. Uh, and, you know, what is scalable and what is repeatable? That is something that you really have to to internalize uh, with your passion. You know, what do you really want to do? And, you know, if you create a startup that generates $300,000 worth of uh, revenue, profits every year that you are taking home, uh, you know, have you failed? Um, you know, or, or is this something that, uh, you know, you've done well? Now, Raj is talking about companies that will be funded by investors that will go public one day and it will soon go from being my startup to our startup. But uh, I wanted to convey the message that if you had created a company which, generated, which is generating a lot of profit, doesn't necessarily mean that you have failed. It's still a great startup. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's really important to know who you are and you know, what your company is and uh, have this inner compass which tells you where in the life cycle you are as you're building your company and growing it and whether you should be around at every you know every day you come in and you figure out whether I should be here or not and whether somebody else should be taking my place and so with that in mind um, I wanted you to know also um, uh, and and take a hard look at what type of company are you founding you know is this a company that is a hardware company, uh, or is it a company that is a software company that you're, you know, software selling software to consumers or customers, or enterprise customers, or are you like Google or Facebook? You're providing a service online. It's really important to have uh, that keen understanding of what you, you know, who you are, right? And uh, um, Along those lines, you need to know, as, uh, and Raj has uh, referred to it earlier, whether you're a business selling to another business or whether you're a business selling to other businesses that are, you know, consumers. Um, 
Selectica, for, so for example, Raj, uh, Raj's first company was a hardware company. Um, his second company was a software company because it was a business selling to another business. And in some cases, it, you know, Selectica was also a company that sold to businesses that sold to consumers. So for example, BMW, uh, uh, was a company that sold cars to consumers, right? Um, or uh, we sold to insurance companies which sold products to consumers. So, so it's, it's important to know whether you're a B2B or a B2B2C or whether you're a B2C. Um, um, and so along those lines, then you have to figure out where, whether you're uh, you know, a pure services company. Uh, like Infosys or TCS, those are all pure services. And nowadays, many of the mature companies uh, on the planet, uh, like IBM and HP, they've all become services companies. And HP has already spun off, is going to spin off its printer and, and computer divisions. And then there are companies like consultancies. You know, these are also legitimate companies. They may not be the companies that Raj is inspiring you to start, which is you know profitable, repeatable, and scalable, but it could be a 50-person company or a 100-person company, which is, you know, and many, some of those companies also go public. Um, or it could be an agency that you have, you know, leading as part of the government, or it could be a nonprofit. Anyway, just keep that in mind uh, as you... Oh, you did? Okay, thank you. So um, before we go on to what is an external theme, I wanted to go over a little bit about um, you know, um, what is your internal theme? Um, um, you know, as, you, as uh, you know, one of the characteristics of figuring out, you know, who does what in a founding team, you know, somebody may be a, a founder, maybe, you know, an engineer, uh, of another founder may, may have outbound skills like a mark, marketing person, and somebody else might be the CEO. In our case, Raj was a CEO. I was a marketing and business development person, and our third co-founder, the, the person who really started it all, was Sanjay. He came up with the, the technology. In most early stage companies, where I've listed, uh, uh, listed there, um, which is above the, the middle grass, uh, uh, call a row, founders, the seeded company, and the Series A, in most of those companies, um, the first the first phase of the company is um, you know exec strategy, engineering, and product management. And those are the three critical components. As the company grows, as you get Series A, then you move to uh, you know hiring some marketing people who can then start talking about what the what the product does and formulating the vision for how the product will be sold. To, to the outside world. And then uh, eventually, then you'll hire business development people. And by then, your director of finance uh, will, will be augmented with a VP of, of finance. Um, and then you'll, you'll get a salesperson. So that is the early stage inter, uh, uh, Series A internal team. As, uh, you know, as you get to Series uh, B and beyond, then you know you'll have IT infrastructure people who are running your IT operations. Uh, you'll have your HR people who are you know setting up company policies, and then professional services. In our case, in Selectica, you know for especially for enterprise software companies, every enterprise. Remember the first customer that Raj was talking about. The customers were always asking for new features or variations, which will eventually find their way into the product. But then you need professional services people. In Raj's case, he had uh, in, the, in his first company he had manufacturing, right? Uh, you the the chip came. You, you had R and D. The chip came back from the lab. Now you have to to build it. And uh, then you know once you start shipping these products, and, and when we had Remedy Corporation, uh, people started buying this product in in droves. Um, you had logistics, uh, you had inter, uh, incoming logistics, inbound logistics, and outbound logistics. You have to deal with your suppliers, you have to you know, assemble the product, and then out, outbound, you have to figure out how it'll go out and, and get distributed uh, to, the, to the outside world. 
So depending on which what the stage of your company is, uh, you will have to scale up the team. And, and this, is, this is essentially the internal team that you have. Um, you know, keep, keep that in mind as, as you are growing your startup. You know, as, as an early stage startup, you know, you will probably be in the first three rows and the first three columns. Um, the first year, first two years, that's where you'll be focusing your, your uh, uh, energy on. But in the, in the second phase, you'll, you know, in the second phase, you'll be in this quadrant. In the third phase, you'll be here. In the fourth phase, you'll be here. That's how you, you look at you scaling up the internal team. It, it, it's a lot depends uh, on whether it is, you know, a Facebook type company or a Google type company or whether it is, uh, you know, an Opti type semiconductor company. It, it all depends. Um, but um, typically, you you bring in you bring in comp uh, a marketing team or, or mar marketing components to your uh, team after the the technology validation has been done, the customer validation is done, uh, and then you have enough money uh, in 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 the bank from investors. To be able to afford a high quality marketing person, otherwise, uh, you know, in in the early stages, you cannot um, you cannot hire uh, you know thorough professionals who can who can deliver the message to the outside world. Um, Raj, uh, feel free to add to that. Anyway, so um, so basically, I would strongly recommend that you know keep an eye out for somebody who's got those capabilities. Because at Opti, there were at least about seven or eight startups that happened at the same time as Opti did. But uh, only Opti, the three uh, Taiwanese engineers at, at Opti, only they brought in, you know, somebody with marketing sales. That's, they brought me in with a marketing sales background. And it just made a total change because we just blew out of the water all the other guys, because they just did not have the ability to market, how to get the press to promote the product, how to position it, how to, and you, you'll see all of that next week. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it takes, uh, it, it, you know, the outbound guys are, unless you have, it's a chicken and egg. If you don't have the product ready, why will they join? And so it, it takes uh, it takes a very interesting uh, marketing and sales guy who's probably has product DNA built in uh, to bring him in at an early stage and accept probably a lot lower stock than the founders do, uh, and yet see the value of what they're getting. That's you know that's the challenge. Um, uh, just one quick question: um, you know there is always something missing. From a from a set, what what is missing from this team? It's a quick uh, quick question. Uh, customer support, yeah, that is in the last phase. Yeah, uh, Raj has Raj had alluded to it earlier. It's the legal team. Yeah, legal. Yeah, so legal is missing, and and typically professional services uh, become the the customer support. Eventually, you have customer support. Okay, next. Um, so, um, you know, so um, Raj wanted me to talk a little bit about the external team. Um, and this is particularly important, you know, he was talking about crisis management, and uh, uh, how to manage the board that would be in the uh, tail end of your course. Uh, uh, but um, I think, you know, think of team holistically. You know, a team is not just the people who are inside the company or uh, your own family members. Um, but the team, uh, the team is also on the first interactions that you have, the first touch points that you have with the outside world. Um, and, uh, you know, the f very first touch points that you have with the outside world are the customers, right? Your first two or three customers um, become, you know, make your company because um, 
they will not only give you honest feedback about your product, um, they will, you know, give you feedback about, you know, the, your whole messaging, but they'll also become references for your venture capitalists. Uh, for us, uh, you know, BMW was a, a, a very critical company-making customer, and they, uh, I remember even through CDC, they were our reference. Uh, each time they would, you know, they would have pick up the phone and be happy to pick up the phone and, and respond um, to, uh, to, you know, the other people who were uh, um, seeking a reference. For example, uh, it could be even press, um, you know, who are trying to write up something about it or, or responding to your marketing people who are creating collateral um, and so on. Um, um, then you have investors. Investors are, uh, there are so many horror stories that can be told about investors, but investors are also your best friends. You, uh, if you pick a right investor, um, not only will they give you money, but they will become your friend at um, the most critical times. They will serve as your sounding board. They will introduce you to customers. They will introduce you to, uh, you know, to people who you who want to hire you. They will uh, be, you know, rainmaking for you. They'll be going to conferences. They'll be dropping your company's name all the time, and uh, they have a very substantial vested interest in the company. And the most most importantly, after all these various uh, milestones have been achieved, they will be talking your company up to the higher valuation. You know, the, the tens of millions or hundreds of millions that Raj is talking about, that happens because investors are willing to put more money um, at a higher valuation uh, to, you know, than the last round. And hopefully all the rounds that you you participate, your Series A, your Series B, Series C, they're all up rounds because sometimes the news is bad and then uh, the rounds can go down in value. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's, not a very, uh, uh, that's not a very pleasant thing. Um, in Silicon Valley, only you hear about the great stories, but there are very many, and the vast majority of stories are uh, not very great stories. You only hear about the Larry Ellison's of the world or the Bill Gates or the Zuckerberg's of the world, but there are many, uh, you know, Silicon Valley is also a graveyard of champions. Uh, there are many, many people, many uh, RIP stones strewn all over the valley. Um, uh, you, you can, you know, go ask any entrepreneur. There are so many stories in the dot-com era where uh, they rejected offers of 250 million or 500 million, and then sold the company for you know one cent on the dollar. You know, uh, there are in you know in, in far more stories like that than the success stories you hear about. Um, and so you have to be very respectful of your investors um, because they will they will be. Uh, with you, you're tied at the hip. Be very careful who you pick as as your investor. Don't take money from everybody. And uh, somebody asked me, you know, when, how quickly can I take money? Uh, I would say, uh, take take money from other people only when you you know most need it. Don't be the that should be the last thing on your mind to take money from other people. Managing other people, because essentially you're managing other people's money. And as soon as you take money from other people, you are their slave. Uh, you, they immediately become your boss. Mm -hmm.